أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي علا في توحده ودنا في تفرده وجل في سلطانه وعظم في أركانه وأحاط بكل شيء علما وهو في مكانه ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه وأفضل بريته سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطاهرين الأئمة الهداة المهديين ولا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين الذي بيمنه رزق الورى وبوجوده ثبتت الأرض والسماء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم وغاصب حقوقهم أبد الآبدين ودهر الداهرين Lately there have been a few charlatans for lack of a better term masquerading as scholars these individuals have been running around accusing Shia scholars of being exaggerators. The term ghulu and ghulat is being thrown around. This label is being slapped on anyone who disagrees with them. Now, in this series, we've tried to address some of their misconceptions and some of their lies and deceptions. Today, I wish to provide yet one more evidence about the deceptive nature of these neo-Salafi imposters. Uh, and what I believe to be one of the strongest arguments against these individuals and groups. Because as I said, what they uh, try to, to present and perhaps the bedrock of their argument is that the beliefs that we find today espoused by the Shia is different from the beliefs of uh, those in uh, previous times. In particular, those in the times of the Imams alayhim salam, right? So the idea that they present is predicated on the concept that the Imams alayhim salam were uh, ulama abrar. They were good righteous people, they were learned scholars, they were people who possessed a great deal of knowledge, but nothing more. There is nothing divinely ordained about them. They weren't appointed by God. They weren't uh, inheritors of the knowledge of the Prophet. They were simply good, hardworking, righteous scholars who were more qualified than others. Sure, they'll at least make this concession, these imposters. They'll make this concession because they're trying to uh, essentially hijack the faith and the beliefs of poor, unsuspecting, ignorant Shia. Essentially, they'll make this concession. And they'll say, look, we love the Ahlul Bayt. The Imams of the Ahlul Bayt were the best. They were the most qualified. They were the most righteous. They were the most pious. But you cannot go further than that. You can't say that the Imams were somehow divinely guided or ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or that they had knowledge uh, that was given to them by God. They had knowledge of the unseen. You can't say any of that. Why? They've created this boogeyman called uh, Ghulu. And they say that you are committing exaggeration. And the Imams have said this and that about Ghulu. The Ghulat have been cursed by the Imams. And anyone who says these things is a Mughali. Therefore, the entire Shia community today is essentially outside the fold of tashayyu. That's basically their deceptive argument in a nutshell. And uh, as I said, this claim is long debunked by the Holy Quran, let alone our established hadith corpus, right? The idea that the Imams were regular people, albeit more knowledgeable than others because they were very hardworking. Right? Um, there might have been people in previous times, during the times of the Imams السلام, themselves, whose understanding of the Imams was this shallow. So the idea that the Imams do not possess any kind of divine knowledge, as described in the previous session, if you haven't 
watched it, go back and watch that. That's very important. It creates some groundwork for the discussion I'm about to present uh, in this session. So people have existed throughout uh, the last 14 centuries. People that even lived in the time of the Imams والسلام, whose understanding of the Imams was shallow. Their recognition of the status of the Imams was deficient, just like these imposters today, right? The reason for that is because they were simple-minded. The reason might have been because they were naive. Or perhaps the reason was that the Imams والسلام, did not possess the ability to uh, speak about their true nature, about their abilities, right? They were governed by uh, oppressive, tyrannical, despotic regimes who would flinch at the hint that the Imams uh, were, uh, you know, people that, that you know, that, that they were claiming to have divine knowledge, right? So the Imams constantly had to downplay their position because they were trying to present themselves to the masses, right? And the masses don't always have the capacity to digest these lofty uh, and advanced discussions. They don't know a lot of these things. Imagine like an elderly 80 year old man who's new to Islam. Obviously there are things about the status of the Holy Prophet the knowledge of the Holy Prophet that you probably wouldn't share with them because there's no point. Their duty is to recognize the Prophet as a Prophet. They don't have a duty to understand the true nature of Rasulullah. Just like you and I don't have a duty to understand how the Prophet was able to, to go from uh, Mecca to Jerusalem in one night in, during the Isra and then the Mi'raj which is to ascend to the heavens to go through the seven heavens we don't understand these things we don't have the capacity to comprehend these advanced concepts our brains our intellects simply lack the capacity they're deficient we don't we cannot understand them and we don't have a duty to understand them. If someone is able to acquire this knowledge through its rightful means, so be it. God bless them, more power to them. But if someone doesn't know these things, what happens? They don't go to hell. If someone doesn't understand that the Imam والسلام, any Imam has knowledge of the unseen, so what? If they recognize the Imam, as someone whose obedience is obligatory, that is enough. They have said as much. We have narrations where the Imams say, "An ta'rifa haqqa, arifan bihaqqa." So the companions would say, "Well, what is it to what does it mean to know the right of the Imam?" The Imams would then elaborate and say, "An ta'rifa annahu imamun ma'sumun muftarad al-ta'a." You have to know that he is infallible. You have to believe that he, his obedience is obligatory. It's mandatory to obey him. That is enough. That is enough for the Imam to then take you to paradise. If you obey him, if you listen to everything that the Imams والسلام, say, that will bring your salvation. And that's, what's, that's the bare minimum. That's acceptable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts that. But if someone comes along, and deliberately tries to undermine the position of the Imams والسلام, in order to tarnish the, the principle of obedience. Because again, let's take a step back. These charlatans, these brum boys, these gangsters, these faith mafia, the reason they try to diminish the position or undermine the position of Imama is because they don't want their ordinances, their commandments to be taken seriously. Because they're trying to make, to distant people from the uh, obedience of the Imams, from the commandments and injunctions of the Imams That's the ultimate goal of people who try to undermine 
their position, right? I will dedicate a session or perhaps more than a session to the concept of ghulu and what ghulu actually is. Historically, who were the ghulat, the exaggerators? What did they say? What was their claim, right? What was their core message? I'll get to that and I will prove once again, as I have multiple times by the blessings of Imam al-Zaman, I will prove to you that when they slap the label of Mughali or Ghulat on our scholars and on the entire Shia community today, how they are lying to you, how our beliefs regarding the Imams is not Ghulu. It is nowhere near Ghulu in fact. I will dedicate sessions to that. But suffice to say that our belief in the Imams السلام, is derived from the Holy Quran and then the established Sunnah of the Holy Prophet Of course, a cynic like these charlatans can come along and reject these ahadith, conveniently throw them away. Of course, they'll try and find a crack here or an issue there or some made up lie in order to uh, reject these ahadith en masse. Of course they do that. That is their job, right? That's what the shaitan does. The shaitan creates these doubts in order to deviate people, right? But at the end of the day, our belief in the Imams السلام, and their divine knowledge, listen very carefully. I will answer this question in this session, inshallah. I will provide the proof that will destroy their arguments, right? That the Imams had divine knowledge, not human knowledge, which destroys the argument that they were ulama abrar, that they were just righteous, good people who worked very hard and they studied very hard and so they became knowledgeable. This impression that you get is an absolute lie. In fact, we will never be able to truly understand who an Imam is. Listen to this hadith. An Kamil al Tamar, Qal Kuntu and Abi Abdullahi alayhi salam that yawm. And this hadith is in fact narrated by Basairu al Darajat, one of the oldest and earliest sources of a hadith. Written by a companion of Imam al-Hasan al-Askari, salawatullahi alayhi. Right? Listen to this hadith. Kamal al-Tammar says that I was uh, in the company of Imam al-Sadiq one day. So the Imam said to, said to me, Ya Kamil, ij'al lana rabban na'ubu ilayh. You have to acknowledge that we have a Lord to whom we turn. A Lord that we need. Right? We are deficient. We are needy and we need this Lord. He is the source of our knowledge. He is the source of our power. He is the source of our very existence. Acknowledge that we have a Lord. But then beyond that, say whatever you want about us. In other words, whatever attribute, whatever attribute is given to the Imams alayhi is not an exaggeration until you reach the ceiling. What's the ceiling? That they were created by Allah. That they have everything they have. They possess everything they possess by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you acknowledge this, then none of the things that is attributed to them, that is established in our hadith and so on, is an exaggeration. وَقُولُوا فِينَا مَا شِئْتُمْ Say whatever you want. So this man, Kamil al-Tammar, he says, I asked the Imam, نَجْعَلُ لَكُمْ رَبًّا تَأُوبُونَ إِلَيْهِ وَنَقُولُ فِيكُمْ مَا شِئْنَا Is it really like that? Is it that simple? That as long as we acknowledge that you are created by Allah and that you get everything you, get, you have from Him, then we can say whatever we want. The Imam, فَاسْتَوَى جَالِسًا He suddenly sat up straight. He was leaning before. Now the Imam took a different posture in a sign of seriousness. فَاسْتَوَى جَالِسًا ثُمَّ قَالْ وَعَسَى أَن نَقُولْ مَا خَرَجَ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنْ عِلْمِنَا إِلَّا أَلِفًا غَيْرَ مَعْطُوفًا The Imam said, in fact, I can tell you that whatever you have received from us, in other words, whatever you know about us, is not 
but uh, an alif, meaning the letter alif, the first letter in the Arabic language. غير معطوفة. Now, allow me to elaborate on this because it's a beautiful uh, metaphor that the Imam provides. The Arabic language has 28 letters. The first is alif. In the old Kufi script, and you can Google this, when they wrote alif, it would begin at the top, then the scribe would go down, and then there, was, there would be a, a tail at the end of the alif. So the letter would go down like this, and there would be this curve that goes underneath. This is what's called ma'tufa. The Imam السلام, said that what you know about us is an alif that lacks the tail. In other words, you haven't even received one letter from the alphabets that are the merits and virtues and the lofty status of the Ahlul Bayt All you have is a fraction of a letter. So, everything that we say is not an exaggeration. If we said that the Imams والسلام, had access to knowledge of the unseen, that is not an exaggeration. Because while we recognize that they have knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they are not the source of their knowledge, but God is, that they are deficient towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they were created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this would not be an exaggeration whatsoever. Whatsoever. What's the proof of that? We have three Imams alayhim salatu wassalam who received the position of Imam in their childhood. The people who talk about the Imams being ulama abrar, being righteous, good, hardworking scholars, the minute they get to the biography of Imam al-Jawad alayhi salatu wassalam, that's when their pens break. That's when they become silenced. That's when they have nothing to say. That's when they're too embarrassed to open their foul mouths. How? Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam became an imam at the age of seven. In fact, he was less than seven years old. Now, this confused a lot of people. And it confused them precisely because it was a new phenomenon. They hadn't witnessed anything like this before. Remember, in the time of Imam al-Sadiq, we have people today, especially you know, Sunni scholars and whatnot, the way they see Imam al-Sadiq is this elderly man who spent a lifetime in scholarship and learning and debates and discussions. And therefore, any knowledge that he possessed was based on the fact that he had a great deal of time to explore, to experiment, to observe, to learn, and therefore he reached the status that he did, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to prove that his vicegerents and his representatives, their knowledge is not human knowledge, as we explained in the previous session. Rather, it is divine knowledge. But that couldn't be proven once and for all. Amir al-Mu'mini became an Imam, then Imam al-Hasan, then Imam al-Hussein, then Imam Zayn al-Abideen, then Imam al-Baqir, then Imam al-Sadiq, then Imam al-Kadhim, then Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam. But it was all a theory at this point, as far as the general masses were concerned. When it came to Imam al-Jawad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to put the theory into practice. Enough time for theories and abstract notions. Now we have to prove this. We have to demonstrate once and for all how the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt acquire their knowledge from God directly and not from others. How? Let me describe for you a scene here. The scene incorporates a group of the upper echelon of Shia community leadership. The companions of the Imams السلام, in particular Imam Ridha, convened at the house of one of these companions in a suburb of Baghdad. The hadith 
is narrated in several books, including Dala'il al Imama by Muhammad ibn Jarir al Tabari uh, or Jurair al Tabari, who was a Shi'i scholar. As a matter of fact, he was one of the most recognizable and uh, learned scholars of the fourth century after Hijrah. He's called Min A'adhimi Ulama al Qarn al Rabi al Hijri. He narrates this hadith. Listen carefully. When Imam al Jawad السلام, his age reached six years, وشهور, six years and a few months, so less than seven, Qatal al Ma'mun Abah. Al Ma'mun killed his father, Imam al Ridha. وَبَقِيَتِ الطَّائِفَةُ فِي حِيرَةٍ وَاخْتَلَفَتِ الْكَلِمَةُ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ So the community of devotees, the Shia, experienced perhaps one of the biggest uh, and most confusing turmoils in its history. They were perplexed because Imam Rida had passed on and now his son was less than seven years of age. The reason was that they felt the age of Imam al Jawad was too young to be an Imam. The Shia were confused across the lands. When Imam Rida passed away, it was in the year 202 after Hijrah, there was this summit, as I said, this convention, this meeting, that incorporated these individuals. Ar-Rayyan ibn Salt. Ar-Rayyan ibn Salt was, uh, is described as Baghdadiyun min uh, aslin Khurasani. He was from Khurasan originally, but he lived in Baghdad. Remember this name, Ar-Rayyan ibn Salt. Wasafwan ibn Yahya, who was one of the companions of Imam Ar-Ridha alayhi salam. In fact, so reliable is this person that he's narrated over a thousand hadith in the Blessed Book of Al-Kafi and other uh, original sources of hadith, right? Safwan ibn Yahya. Who else? Wa Muhammad ibn Hakim, wa Abdul Rahman ibn Al-Hajjaj, wa Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman. Who was Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman? You need to also recognize this name. Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman was min fuqaha uh, al-ashab. He was a companion of Imam Baqir, Imam al kadhim and then Imam Al-Ridha alayhi salatu wasalam. So he was a contemporaneous with at least three Imams. And you know, there are lots of stories that deal with, with him, but suffice to know that he was a, a great companion and someone who was a jurist, a knowledgeable faqih, right? So uh, Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman wa jama'atun min wujuh al-'isaba fi dar Abdul Rahman ibn al-Hajjaj. So it wasn't just these four individuals or five individuals, there were others who had convened in the house of Abdul Rahman ibn al-Hajjaj yabkuna wa yatawajjauna min al-musibah. They were weeping, they were sobbing in pain and agony from the tragedy that has just befallen them, the death of Imam Ar-Ridha alayhi salatu wasalam. فَقَالَ لَهُمْ يُونُسْ Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman, this great sage, this scholar, this companion of the Imams, he stopped them at one point and he said, دَعُوا buka, stop crying. We have more important matters that we need to deal with. دَعُوا buka. مَنْ لِهَذَا الْأَمْرِ يُفْتِي بِالْمَسَائِلِ إِلَىٰ أَنْ يَكْبُرَ هَذَا الصبي. Who's going to take the position of leadership? for the Ummah, for the nation, for the community of the Shia, and to give them guidance and to answer their questions on halal and haram until this young boy grows up to be an adult. Now, you can under understand this statement in two ways. First of all, let's not forget that Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman, being the great scholar that he is, he's not denying the position of Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam. He fully recognizes that the Imam is the Imam. Ma'soomun muftarad al ta'ah, right? He doesn't have an issue with that whatsoever. Now we have two possibilities. One, that he assumes that because of the age of Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam, then he cannot take this position. 
while he's an imam and he needs to be recognized and respected and whatnot, but his age will prevent him from being able to respond to the questions of the believers. That is one possibility. The other possibility is that he doesn't even have a problem with that. And, and I lean on to, to this particular scenario. He knows Imam al-Jawad is more than capable. The issue is he doesn't see how the community will recognize Imam al-Jawad, how the community will accept the Imam given his very young age. So perhaps Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman is uh, he's, he's concerned about the optics, if you like, right? I'm using uh, modern lingo here. He's concerned about what people might say or how they might react to an Imam who is less than seven years old. So he makes this comment, Ar-Rayyan ibn Salt, ibn Salt gets up. Now, there are multiple versions of this hadith. In one of them, it says that Rayyan ibn Salt engaged in a physical and verbal altercation with Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman. And then he said to him, In kana, in kana amrum min Allahi jalla wa ala. If the position of imama is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we all believe, فَإِبْنُ يَوْمَيْنِ مِثْلُ إِبْنِ مِئَةِ سَنَةِ Whether he's two years old or he's a hundred years old, what difference does it make? Age has no bearing on the position of imama if it's ordained by God, if it's an appointment by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the knowledge is divine knowledge, then the age doesn't factor into the equation. If the knowledge is empirical, if it's human knowledge, sure. But we don't believe that, do we? إِنْ كَانَ أَمْرٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ جَلَّ وَعَلَىٰ فَإِبْنُ يَوْمَيْنِ مِثْلُ إِبْنِ مِئَةِ سَنَةِ وَإِنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ And if it's not an appointment by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if these imams simply inherit each other just like normal human beings, just like members of the royal family, for example, right? فَلَوْ عَمَّرَ الْوَاحِدُ مِنَ النَّاسِ خَمْسَةَ آلَافِ السَّنَةِ مَا كَانَ يَأْتِي بِمِثْلِ مَا يَأْتِي بِهِ السَّادَةُ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّلَامِ Even if that is the case, then even if he lives until he's 5,000 years old, he won't be able to give us the kind of knowledge and guidance that the Imams alayhim salam could give us. In other words, if Abu Ja'far al-Jawad alayhi salatu was salam is not a divinely appointed Imam, then it doesn't matter how long we wait, he will never mature, quote unquote, to the point where he can lead us. But that's not what we believe. We believe that he's an imam from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aw bi He won't even give us a part of what the imams used to give us. He doesn't have it. He simply doesn't have it. Aw wa mimma yanbaghi an yunzara feeh. Is that even up to debate? Is that even something we're going to discuss here? Whether Imam al-Jawad is appointed by Allah or not appointed by Allah? What does this tell you? It tells you that there was consensus. It tells you that there was no disagreement about the Imam of Imam al-Jawad in spite of his six years and few months of age. It tells you that all of the Shia, all of their leaders, all of the companions, all of these great scholars who were taught at the feet of the Imams والسلام, recognized fully the position of Imam al-Jawad. Their knowledge came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَقْبَلَتِ الْعِصَابَةُ عَلَىٰ يُونُسْ تُعَذِّلُهُ وَتُوَبِّخُهُ At that point, the, all of the conveners, all of the participants in this uh, meeting, they all began to admonish Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman. How could you say this? How could you even utter these words? Whether the community accepts the Imam or not, doesn't matter. He is the Imam. He needs to lead. He is the one who is going to lead us to salvation and bring us to the shores of safety. Who cares what the community says? Who cares what the world says? The Imam السلام, will establish his position. He will establish his knowledge better than you or us or anyone else in the world can ever do so. So, what are these people going to say now? The Imams were ulama abrar. The Imams were hardworking, good, pious people. How do you explain a seven-year-old becoming an Imam? 
How do you explain a seven-year-old sitting down, being challenged by Yahya ibn Aktham, who was the top scholar of his day, who came and asked him questions and was left flabbergasted, his jaw dropped, and the jaws of everyone around him at the incredible, impeccable, limitless knowledge of Imam al-Jawad How do you explain that? A six and a half year old. Go on, I'll wait. Let's see what you have to offer. Ulama abrar. If they're not appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how do you explain the fact that when Ma'mun al-Abbasi was challenged by his own family members, by Bani al-Abbas who came to him saying, you appointed a rida as your crown prince, as your successor, and we had to play along with that. You insisted he be the uh, wali al-ahd and we agreed. But now you bring us a seven-year-old and you make him your heir apparent, you make him your crown prince. Because that's what he did, right? After Imam al-Rida, after he killed Imam al-Rida alayhi salam, in order to cover up his crime, he brought Imam al-Jawad and he said, you're my successor. So Ben al-Abbas came and said, are you, are you playing games with us? Are you joking? So what did he do? This cunning deceiver, who's described in the hadith of the Ahlul Bayt as Ifrit, he brought the biggest minds in the nation. and He led a nation that was so vast and expansive. It was bigger than any superpower today. He brought all of these people, including Yahya ibn Aktham and others. And he said, challenge him. Let's see how he does. As far as Ma'mun was concerned, it was win-win. Either the Imam would lose all shreds of credibility by being unable to respond to the questions, which was what he expected. Or the Imam would in fact prove that he is divinely ordained, that he has knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Imam al-Jawad sit, sits there. Yahya ibn Aktham says to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, what is the ruling regard, regarding a person who hunts while he is in the state of ihram? Allahu Akbar. What the Imam did to this man. The Imam said to him, he started asking him questions. He said to him, was this in the daytime or the nighttime? Was it a domesticated animal or a wild, wild animal? Was it an animal with four legs or a bird? Was it uh, uh, this or that or this or that? A six-year-old? Yahya ibn Aktham didn't even have the audacity to ask the Imam for proof. Because at the end of all of this, when the Imam finished asking all these questions, he then said to him, you tell me, Ibn Rasulullah. So the Imam began to tell him the answer to each of those questions that branched out from the original topic. He didn't have the audacity to ask the Imam for proof. Because he knew, he knew. He's an expert in this field. He's a faqih himself. He knows that if you know all these things, then you also have, have the proof. He knows that if you're a six-year-old speaking like this, then you have divine knowledge, not human knowledge. Allahu Akbar. Remember, this was a challenge. This was supposed to be a chance for Yahya ibn Aktham to prove that the Imam was not an Imam. That he was but a boy. That he was just like the children of all of these princes and these kings and monarchs. And yet he, did not, he could not challenge him any further. Or the story of when Imam al-Jawad was summoned to the court and asked uh, that we've caught a thief and we don't know how much of his hand should be amputated. Go and look up these stories which have been established because they happened in, a, uh, in the royal courts. There were hundreds of witnesses to this and to other miracles of Imam al-Jawad Ulama abrar. Let's see how you Twist and turn your way out of this one. As a matter of fact, Imam al-Ridha alayhi salatu wasalam had paved the way for the Imama of Imam al-Jawad. First of all, as I said, his birth was a miracle in and of itself. The Imama of Imam al-Jawad was not challenged. Yes, there was confusion at first, as I said. 
the people didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't understand how Imam al-Jawad would establish his position, right? So the, there was some confusion before they got to see the Imam or hear about him. But no one challenged the Imam of Imam al-Jawad. Why? His birth was miraculous. Imam Rada, as I said, did not have a child until he was 45 years old. The waqifa, in other words, those deviant groups who said that Imam al-Kadhim was the last Imam, they were accusing Imam, of, uh, accusing Imam al-Ridha of uh, being infertile, of not being able to conceive, not having any children. So the Shia would come to the Imam, they would say to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, what's going to happen? These people are saying that you're infertile, you're not going to have any children. And the Imam would constantly reassure them, don't worry, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do something. Allah will give me a boy, Allah will do this, Allah will do that. And so when Imam al-Jawad was born, when Imam al-Rada was in, in his mid-40s, that put an end to all of the lies and deceptions, to all of the misconceptions that were leveled against Imam al-Rada alayhi salam. So when Imam al-Jawad became the Imam, when he succeeded his father, while there was disagreement about the Imama of Imam al-Rida, his father, there was no disagreement about the Imama of Imam al-Jawad. And later when Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam also succeeded his father, at the age of six, Imam al-Hadi was even younger than Imam al-Jawad. Not a single challenger because it had been established. The theory had turned into practice. The idea that God's knowledge, divine knowledge, is what is in the possession of the Prophet and his successors, the Imams السلام, was now proven once and for all. Later when Imam al-Mahdi became an Imam at the age of five, no question amongst the Shia, no challenge, no confusion. It had been established. And as I said, Imam Rida paved the way for this. How? Listen to this hadith. And Safwan ibn Yahya, we mentioned his name in the previous hadith, this great companion. He said that I told Imam al-Rida, Kunna nas'aluka anil imam ba'dak. We used to ask you about the imam who would succeed you. Qabla an yahab Allahu laka Abu Ja'farin. Before Allah endowed you and blessed you with Abu Ja'far, meaning Imam al-Jawad. Wa kunta taqool, yahab Allahu li ghulaman, wa qad wahab Allahu lak. You used to say that Allah will give me a boy. And now Allah has given you this boy. Allah has illuminated our eyes. He has delighted us with you having a son. And may God never show us your day, meaning the day of your departure. May we never live to see the day you die, Ibn Rasulullah. But if God forbid this were to happen, then who do we turn to? Who will... Who will give us our salvation? Allahu Akbar, how beautiful the demeanor they had, the way they spoke to their Imam. Who do we turn to? فَأَشَارَ بِيَدِهِ إِلَىٰ أَبِي جَعْفَرِ The Imam pointed to his son Imam al-Jawad. وَهُوَ قَائِمٌ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ The Imam was standing before him. Imam al-Jawad was a young boy. فَقُلْتُ جُعِلْتُ فِدَاكِ So Safwan ibn Yahya says, I told the Imam, may I be ransomed for you, may I die for you. وَهَوَىٰ إِبْنُ ثَلَاثِ سِنِينَ He's only three years old. How could he be our Imam? فَقَالَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامُ وَمَا يَضُرُّهُ ذَلِكْ Imam Rada said, and what's wrong with that? How would that hurt his chances, if you like, or diminish his ability to be an Imam? قَدْ قَامَ عِيسَىٰ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامُ بِالْحُجَّةِ وَهَوَىٰ إِبْنُ سَنَتَيْنَ Jesus became a prophet when he was only two years old. And in another version of the hadith, the Imam says the following, listen carefully. He says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ سُبْحَانَهُ بَعَثَ عِيسَىٰ Verily, surely, Allah sent Isa رَسُولًا نَبِيًّا صَاحِبَ شَرِيعَةٍ مُبْتَدَىٰ Allah sent Isa as a messenger, as a prophet, and one who brought a new religion, Sharia, And that's the difference between a Nabi and an Imam. The position of an Imam is higher than that of a Nabi according to the Quran. Imama, when he 
finished all of those tests, when he passed them with flying colors, that's when he became an imam. So, an imam is higher than a prophet. But the difference between a prophet and an imam is that a prophet brings a new religion, the imam doesn't do that. The imam simply succeeds the prophet that came before him. In this case, the greatest of prophets had the greatest of imams. So, the imam says that Isa came with a new religion. He was a prophet. All these things, في أصغر من السن الذي فيه أبو جعفر When he was younger than the age of Imam Al-Jawad السلام, Remember Imam Al-Jawad at that point was three years old. Imam Rada is saying Jesus was two years old. So what? In other words, there is a Quranic precedent for this. We've seen this before. How? فأشارت إليه قالوا كيف نكلم من كان في المهد صبيا When Maryam السلام, pointed to the crib pointed to the child, the, to the infant in the crib and said, speak to him. They said, how do we speak to this young boy? I am God's slave. He has given me the book and he has made me what? A prophet. The other example in the Quran, Ya Yahya, خذ الكتاب بقوة وآتيناه الحكمة صبية. Allah says we gave hukum, the authority, meaning prophethood to Yahya when he was but a boy. So there is Quranic precedent for this. A prophet can be a prophet when he's a child. An imam can be an imam when he's a child. What difference does it make? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordains the prophet with his knowledge and he ordains and blesses the imam with his knowledge and his position of authority as well. Imam Rada alayhi salam says in another hadith, to a man called Muammar ibn Khallad, who was one of his companions, he said to him, Hada Abu Ja'far, qad ajlastuhu majlisi. This is my son, Abu Ja'far, meaning Imam al-Jawad. I have put him in my seat, wasayyartuhu makani, I have put him in my place. How else is the Imam supposed to tell the people that he is my successor? Waqal inna ahlu baytin yatawarathu asaghiruna akabirana al qiddata bil qidda. We, are, we come from a family where our children inherit what the adults give to them. وَقَالَ الْإِمَامُ رَضَى عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامُ After Imam Al-Jawad was born, the Imam said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ وَهَبَ لِي مَنْ يَرِثُنِي وَيَرِثُ آلَ دَاوُودِ Allah has blessed me with one who will inherit, inherit me and inherit the family of Dawood alayhi salam. The knowledge of prophets and messengers and God's greatest Apostles. And sure enough, Imam al Jawad proved his Imama and his divinely ordained knowledge over and over again. Some of our scholars have collected the number of miracles performed by Imam al Jawad and they've put the number at 72. 72 different miracles, one more extraordinary than the other, even as a child. In one report, it is said that after the death of Imam al-Rida alayhi salam, Imam al-Jawad came to the mosque of Rasulullah. Ji'a bihi ila masjid Rasulullah ba'da mawti abih. Wa huwa tiflun, and he was just a child. Wa ja'a ila al-minbar wa raqa minhu darajatan. He came to the pulpit and sat on the first step of the pulpit. Thumma nataqa faqal, then he spoke. He said, Ana Muhammad ibn Ali al-Rida, ana al-Jawad. I know people's genealogy, but not the one that goes backwards, but the one that goes forwards. In other words, you might have knowledge of genealogy and you could say who somebody's ancestor is, right? You, you, you might know their family tree. Imam Rida is saying, I can tell you who your children are going to be. I know your secrets and I know your evident truths. And I can tell you what's going to happen to you. This knowledge was given to us before the creation of everything. And this knowledge encompasses everything even after the destruction of the entire 
world, the heavens and the earth. Had it not been for the fact that the tyrants are uh, in power, and that there are doubters and cynics like these charlatans that we are dealing with in this day and age, had it not been for people like them, I would have said things to you that would leave you perplexed and amazed, not just you, but everyone from the beginning of time to the end of time. The Shia sent a delegation of 80 scholars to go and explore who the next Imam is after Imam al they gathered in the house of Imam al-Sadiq. It's a long story. I don't want to get into it. They came. They asked questions. First, they asked the uncle of Imam al-Jawad. And he was unable to respond to their queries. Then Imam al-Jawad came, this young boy, and they asked him questions. And they found their answers. As a matter of fact, one of the ways the Imam proved to them that he was the Imam is that he, they would come to him. And before they asked him the questions, he would give them the answer. And everyone would know immediately. There is no way. The Imam could have learned this. He could have acquired this. He could have studied this in books. He would tell them their intentions, right? I'll conclude with this particular story because when speaking about Imam al Jawad, السلام, you have to acknowledge the role that one particular individual uh, played in establishing the Imamah of uh, Al-Jawad alayhi salatu wassalam. Who was this person? The person was Ali ibn Ja'far. Ali ibn Ja'far was the uncle of Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam. Because he was the son of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, which makes him the, Imam, the uncle of Imam al-Ridha. So as far as Imam al-Jawad is concerned, he was his father's uncle. So there was a massive age disparity between them, right? He's the son of Imam al-Sadiq. He was the companion. He was the son of an Imam, the brother of an Imam, the uncle of an Imam. His time spent with all of these Imams made him a sage and a scholar of the highest caliber. He had his own students. He had his own school. He would narrate traditions. Like imagine. Narrating from your father, your brother, your nephew, right? One day, the hadith says, and this is mentioned in the blessed book of Al-Kafi, دَخَلَ عَلَيْهِ أَبُو جعفر الجواد عليه السلام. Imam Al-Jawad entered Al-Masjid, meaning Masjid Al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa Ali ibn Ja'far, this elderly man, long gray beard, teacher, sage, scholar, notable, personality. He was there teaching many people who had gathered around him. As soon as Imam al-Jawad, this young seven-year-old boy, stepped into the masjid, فَوَثَبَ عَلِيُّ بْنُ جَعْفَرْ بِلَا حِذَاءٍ وَلَا رِدَاءٍ Ali ibn Ja'far ran. He rushed towards his nephew's son without shoes or without putting his cloak on as a sign of uh, humility and also uh, hastening. He didn't bother with formalities. Then he kissed the hand of Imam al-Jawad and he honored and glorified him. The Imam said to him, imagine this young boy telling this old man, sit down, O oh uncle, may Allah bless you. So Ali ibn Ja'far responded, Ya Sayyidi, كيف أجلس وأنت قائم? My master, how can I sit when you are still standing? فلما رجع Ali ibn Ja'far إلى مجلسه When Ali ibn Ja'far went back after greeting the Imam and saying his salams, he went back to his gathering with his students. When he went back, جعل أصحابه يوبخونه His students began admonishing him and saying, how could you do this? You're a scholar, you have your reputation to safeguard. You are his father's uncle. What's wrong with you? Control yourself. So he responded by saying, Uskutu! Silence! Allah 
if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't deem this beard of mine worthy of being appointed as an imam myself, Allah didn't deem this worthy. But he deemed this young boy worthy of that position. And he put him in that seat. Do I deny him? Do I say that I am more worthy? I should be the Imam? نَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِمَّا تَقُولُونَ بَلْ أَنَا لَهُ عَبْدٍ I seek refuge in Allah from what you're saying. I am but a slave of His. Allow me to share uh, another beautiful story about uh, Ali ibn Ja'far and Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam. One day Imam al-Jawad was about to perform a medical procedure which is similar to hijama. Hijama uh, is sometimes referred to as wet cupping uh, and it's where you create these small uh, incisions and draw blood. Uh, the procedure that the Imam, Imam al-Jawad was about to perform was called Fasd. And Fasd is similar except it's not done on the back or the head. It's done on uh, a, an artery or uh, a major vein. So they take a scalpel or an, a sharp object, sometimes a rock, and they would use it to draw blood. So the hadith says, The physician came forward and he was about to uh, sever the vein of Imam al-Jawad to draw the blood. فَقَامَ عَلِيُّ بْنُ جَعْفَرِ فَقَالَ يَا سَيِّدِي تَبْدَأُ بِي لِتَكُونَ حِدَّةُ الْحَدِيدِ فِيَّ قَبْلَكِ He said, my master, let me be the first to do this so that the, the sharpness of the scalpel reaches me before it reaches you. It hurts me before it hurts you. Subhanallah. So then, قَالَ قُلْتُ يُهَنِّئُكَ اللَّهِ هَذَا عَمُّ أَبِيهِ May Allah bless you. This is the uncle of his father. And yet this is how he treats Imam al-Jawad. When the Imam was finished and the procedure was done, the Imam was about to get up. So Ali ibn Ja'far got up and he uh, aligned the two slippers of Imam al-Jawad for him to wear them. Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam proved that he was divinely ordained and that his knowledge came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala such that as we said earlier when it was time for Imam al-Hadi to assume that position there was consensus among the Shia there was no question there was no doubt whatsoever that he was divinely ordained when Imam al-Zaman became the Imam at the age of five it was exactly the same so when people tell you that the beliefs we have today they're very different from when they were before and that there is exaggeration there is ghulu there is this that and the other you take all of that and you throw it in the rubbish bin the fact of the matter is that the Imam of Imam al-Jawad alayhi salatu was salam is proof definitive ultimate proof that the Imam's position is appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that his knowledge comes from Allah, knowledge of the unseen becomes easy to comprehend, or at least to acknowledge. Having knowledge from God is what allowed the Imams to be who they were. And this is why when Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam was born, Imam al-Ridha said, Ma wulida fil Islam. No one has ever been born in Islam. A'va mubarakatan min. Who has a greater blessing, who is a greater blessing to Islam and to tashayyu' and to the faith than Imam al Jawad alayhi salam. Why? Because he ended this debate once and for all. Because if there was any doubt for people who lived in the time of Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq and Imam al-Kadhim and whatnot about the divine appointment of the Imams, about their knowledge, about their abilities, there was no longer any doubt whatsoever. Which is why when Imam al-Hadi alayhi salatu was salam came, the Imam gave us a ziyaratul jami'atul kabira, this great manifesto of introducing us to the stations of the Imams alayhim salatu was salam. That is why our scholars today say that Ziyaratul Jama'ah is nowhere near an exaggeration. 
Ziyaratul Jama'ah has uh, all of these attributes of the Imams that you can prove from the Quran, you can pre- prove from the Aql. There's no question that our belief uh, with regards to the Imams السلام, is what has been described in this incredible piece of literature, this great ziyara known as Ziyarat Al Jama'ah Al Kubra. May Allah bless you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.